Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa, founder and editor in chief at Tint Journal, and I'm welcoming you to this edition of Tinted Tales Reading Across Cultures, our reading series. Tint Journal is, as you probably already know when you're on our YouTube page by now, a literary journal dedicated to writers who write in English as their second or non native language. Um, so, sorry, I just had a back in my um, back coming from my audio. So, yeah, Tint is about um, writing in English as your second or non native language. And on our website, tintjournal.com, we publish short, short stories, poems, and also nonfiction texts by writers who write in something else than their mother tongue. And we also publish reviews on books written by ESL writers, or we do interviews with ESL writers, everything um, for free to access at tintjournal.com. And today um, we are here to celebrate this kind of multi and translingual writing already for the fifth time, which is really incredible. And today is also a little bit different than what we've done before because we don't have a musician, but instead we are participating in the CCTA event. So the climate change theater action. And we're doing so by showing two plays. We're going to hear an eco poem. And um, we're also featuring a discussion how climate change sort of interacts with art and society. But my colleague Andrea will tell you more when the time is ready. OK, and now that we are all here, um, I also, of course, want to welcome all the wonderful writers who are joining us for today. So let's have a look and let's give a warm hello to everyone on the writer's side for tonight. Wonderful. So if you want to give a little wave to the audience, you can do so now. <laughs> Sweet. Perfect. So it's really fascinating. Uh, we're joined by readers from writers from all across the world, Lisa Batista, Tim Tim Chang, Mario Machinko, Susmita Paul, Gamse Saimas, Philip Steiner, and Lisa Suess. Um, this is really a great assembly today, and I'm so happy that we can host this on Tint Journal. All right, now we're almost ready um, to start. Before I give the floor to our first batch of writers, I would like to um, point you to two tinted things though. So first of all, we're still open for submissions. Um, if you're a writer and you write in English as your second or non-native language, please do send your work along to tintjournal.com slash submit. You find all the information there. Um, and you can do so until November 30. So for six more days, the clock is ticking. But if you want to send in something, please do so. And I'm sure that I can also speak for our prose editor, Matt, and our poetry editor, Chan. We're super, super excited to read all the work that you're sending to us. And I want to thank you beforehand, if you plan to do so, that you entrust us with reading your work. Um, so that's that for our open call. And as you might have already noticed, um, we're starting a fundraiser. Um, you find our current fundraiser on gofundme.com. Um, the chat should be, uh, the link to the fundraiser should be in the YouTube chat any second. It's sort of an out of the ordinary fundraiser because you know we're also in Ko-Fi and on Patreon and you can support us from there. But with this fundraiser, we have also set a goal that goes beyond what we've been doing so far. Namely, we don't just want to keep producing our issues as we do as a nonprofit journal, but we also want to start to pay our contributing writers. And to do so, we need your help. Um, so if you like what we do, and if you want to support us um, and the journal and also the writers who we publish, please have a look at our fundraiser and donate what Ever you can really any contribution counts to yeah help us achieve this goal all right so thanks again for joining tonight um, thanks to the writers thanks to you in the audience of course with whom without whom um, none of this would be possible anyways so thank you for being here even though it's only virtually we all know that but 
I'm super happy that we can host this today. And I think it's probably time to actually get into it. So let me introduce to you the first of our performing writers for tonight. This is Mario Machinko. He is an Austrian-born hobby author with Croatian roots. After he moved from Tyrol to Syria for his bachelor in translation studies, he began writing by applying the gained linguistic refinement and research skills. Since starting his master's studies in English and American literature, he has been committed to writing stories with a sentimental appeal in character-driven arcs. And today he's going to read a part of his story, Train Out of Time, or the whole story actually, uh, which was published in our latest issue, Fall 21. You can also read it up there. And Mario, the stage is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lisa. As the legendary Transsibirskaya sets out on the mammoth path of East Ward Wales, the blunt block of architecture that is the Yaroslavsky terminal slides sideways out of sight. With a pedantic ire at the thought that this will be my last memory of Moscow before I enter the white wastes of Russia's eastern reaches, I ask about fleeing my half-finished studies and a town in dire need of social opportunities was worth all the hours and savings I put into this trip without a goal. If the journey is its only way, as they like to say, I simply didn't earn that one. In spite of my indecisive feelings towards my knee-jerk venture, I feel at home. Perhaps I have been in the country for too long, but I blame this attitude less on an appropriative nativity claim than my aesthetic neuroticism. My eyes are closed as the train picks up speed, and I imagine a transformation of the terminal, some surreal shift into St. Basil's. The typical straight walls of alabaster and the sharp golden crowns twist and turn into the more artistic cathedral in the expanse of the red square, sprinkled and speckled in all possible hues, dominated by crimson, and the towers topped with those nine onion-shaped ice cream scoops of white and colored stripes. Then I open my eyes, and I let that escapist picture empower me from the back of my head to lend me strength and wish with while the Slavic spirit that attended me during my solitary stay in the European sliver of the country is fading from my sentimental memories, the rolling grass of bleak, bleak brown replaces them with a feeling of transition, the notion of a preliminary place between planes. And circled by the translucent image of a mountain range in the far distance behind the fields, glimmering in blue and teal, the phantom titans face in and out just barely hiding the reality beyond my understanding. I should look away, away from the depression I fled in search for something worth doing, since nostalgia for a place without purpose would render my stray wandering in the past weeks just as meaningless. It feels so much longer, actually. Care to spare a spot for a random drifter or a Muscovite brother if that suits you? Thankful for the distraction, I crane my neck to face the visitor. I intend to tell him no, of course, as I like to think that only my paranoid caution has kept me safe from the horror stories told often about globetrotters and backpackers. This fellow's face, however, sports a soft hint of a friendly soul. No, actually not friendly. That's not on the spot. Rather, he looks solemn. Yes, that's it, solemn. Whether due to the barely ragged and rugged jacket and jeans, the slightly scruffy visage without danger, or the agreeable glint in the gray of his cool eyes, my natural alarm deactivates for once, leaving behind my weakness for those in need. Logically speaking, the six seats, three opposite three, can accommodate at least one more. And so I nod, dry yet firm, signaling the man to enter. Oh, thank you, he says grimly, all but sulking like a child as he throws his backpack larger than mine and audibly heavy, on the opposite row of seats at the door side. Shown a consideration to my privacy that I did not quite expect under these circumstances, the last vestiges of my distrust depart. You know, the man sighs as he takes off his shiny shoes. People are cold lately, adequate to the town and place. 
He chuckles at his own obscure joke as he crosses his fortunate clean-looking, sock-covered feet to see the cross, stretching his legs with gusto. But I'm glad to have stumbled across a warmer soul in late summer. As he folds his arms in some preparation that is mirrored in his softly glowing regard, I wonder how to react now. So, care to share? I frown. Uh, I shared, didn't I? Another chuckle. As the light lotter deflates, the face shifts some sort of melancholy intelligence. The change still brings not a trace of unease with it, though I wonder whether this is the same person I let into this presently silent compartment. If my perception does not deceive me, and I assume from experience that it does not, I join the brooding soul, he says, then seems to notice my surprise at his sudden eloquence. But I will not pressure you. I have my own share of secrets. Feel free to engage in an exchange when you're ready. While awfully involved in a stranger's private affairs at first, the man takes a step back and minds his own business, staring and smiling into space, not even seeming to register me. My own mind returns to the sliding sheets of scenery beyond the British glass to my side. And only after a few minutes do I realize that my mouth is moving, that words are getting out, that I'm talking about the twists and turns of my being, from the boring to the curious stuff, from my bland bourgeois upbringing to my existential crisis during college, it catapulted me into an east spot search for sense in cultures and customs, quest for solutions to my riddles. It's not just a cliche to equate ignorance with bliss, I interrupt my telling for a more emotional, rather than factual memory. At one point, a person can learn too much, you know. It was sneaking into my mind gradually, taking possession of my soul step by step. Poetic, the listener murmurs, smiling between amusement and awe. No, I'm serious. They teach you theory and questions, fill your brain with raw curiosity, until you're left a shell replete with questions and yearning for answers. So I left for its search. I'm done with questions. Instead of wasting any more time with house, I'll focus on that. And then I assume that they're unlikely to feel a sense of awe innate in such a search. I am baffled for a moment. If this is above my pay grade, I should have stayed at home. Of course, I need to fire a smart answer. If I, if I see every phase of the cube, not just random squares, I'll understand enough about the cosmos so that I never have to feel awe. That's my goal. Enlightenment. Cheesy? Maybe. Fulfilling? Absolutely. But the world is a sphere. The reply comes dry and direct, like a prepared response. Infinite sides means no end to the search. Again, speechlessness overcomes me. Yet even as I fail to hide it, I'm not mocked. The man has grown utterly thoughtful concerning my hidden, humble self. But I can see as much as my faculties allow. My response is weak, but I am content. The still approachably familiar Russia was just meant to be my access to another continent. But I liked it so much that it remained for too long. Then, reminding myself of my actual aims, I broke out of my shell again, just when we met. And so I continued the journey. Throughout the entirety of my account, the man listens and nods, as if in expect and knowing. When I finish, he smiles in satisfaction, as if my story somehow gave him happiness. So, I say, throwing my arms up, now you know basically everything about me. Indeed, the man with the shifted persons responds with an oddly haughty charm. And now you want me to return the favor, right? It would be fair if you don't let leave in Nizhny, that is, we have time. We passed Nizhny, comrade. I gasp and glare out the window expecting nothing of a Russian September plane of nature. Instead, I witness the impossible truth behind the claim. The grassland, now scarce and grayer, is now accompanied by what can only be the Volga flowing like fluid glass. Yet it feels like Russia. We are now about to enter the beauty of Kazakhstan, the voice behind me explains, mixing confidence with consideration. And to my company, barely finding my breath. H how long was the talking, anyway? A decent while, the man shrugs. The train is faster. 
Kazakhstan. Do I bear skin to the eye? His consideration fuses with contempt. Sorry. Some strain between his brows that makes you wonder just what the hell is going on. You still believe her in a fancy. His words make me wish to jump out. Yet his face doesn't fail to call me. Didn't you feel strange when Trent departed Moscow? Yeah, some sort of relation, detachment like. A confused medley of feeling strikes. And I shake my head. Wait, who are you, man? Me? Front and surprise. Why, I'm the conductor. He thumbs at the car. The train is self sufficient enough in this age of automation, but it still needs a caretaker. Safety reasons, you understand. My main occupation is chit chatting with the passengers. An air of holistic honesty shines in him, and I feel helplessly hasty to trust his words, even though I have many questions to pose. I want to ask why he looks like a cross between an attorney who has seen more successful days and the tramp with a good sense of self-care. My more sincere side whispers a desire to know the man's identity, but a different voice counters that it doesn't really matter. The conductor is just a man, as my sense let me know. This individual here is a frivolous eccentric indeed, but nothing more than a man after all. Well, all I have left is to quench my thirst for the most immediate source of curiosity. Where is this train heading for then? Oh, everywhere, he responds with boisterous gusto, waving with his hands over some imaginary world between his eyes and mine. And the real fun of it is the randomness. The route is never the same twice in a row, you know. The conductor stretches himself with lavish passion, ignoring a baffled stare. I have a feeling it will take a break in China next, but my inner radar gets a dead indistinct after that. But the tracks I mutter struggling to find words. And the plan, the time, the, it's a timeless train, the conductor says, more serene than ever. That's all this is. All of a sudden, I wish to peer into the black box and grasp its preternatural ways, fades away in the rush of wind behind the surreal locomotive on its other world, the railroads. The train could stop on the moon next, and I would not look thrice. Again, I just accept the strange. What can I call you, I ask? yet not out of curiosity, but the fulfillment of familiarity. Fyodor, the conductor says, coming cool, just call me Fyodor. Well, Fyodor, I guess you owe me a story now. His smirk of utmost respect is his answer. What follows is a flow of memories, existential narratives of ambiguities and polarizations, times of intelligence and wisdom, times of playfulness and foolishness, of grand abundance, of squalid poverty, of facing something like death, knowing something like life, times of strength, times of weakness, of light and of dark. I wonder how much of being can fit into the spirit of but one mortal man, but it is again strange that makes everything so convincing. My distracted perception is only a nebulous note of a porcelain samovar with a Russian caravan that at one point suddenly stands between the excited talker and me. When the table is sorted out to make space for the steaming kettle is likewise beyond me. Although I blame the fine scent, which most likely enamored my senses beyond function. And as the best of tales go, this tale reaches an end, which feels to have come too soon. By the end, I feel like comprehending the cosmos itself. And that's all there is, Fear finishes, as is having told me about the weather. Quite literally, indeed, I love, convinced that nothing will ever amaze me anymore. I think at this brief moment of silence. I can't pinpoint what exactly seems so astonishing about Fyodor's prosaic tale, but it's more like a feeling. My dazed mind finds a semblance of stability when I see Fyodor glance at a watch that I didn't notice before on his left wrist. It's time, Fyodor murmurs, barely audible, failing to suppress a satisfied smile. And for what, I ask? He eyes me as if I just denied the roundness of the globe. Why, time for everything, of course, he shrugs, his serene satisfaction never fading. The train is fueled by time and needs to charge first by crossing some space. Now it's full. The tank? He raises his hands, his palms preemptively, silencing any words that might follow from my mouth. Don't try to make sense of everything, he tells me, before nodding out the window. 
Just take a look or two at the fine scenery behind this clean glass and you enjoy the show. The window pushes and concurrently pulls my eyes, struggling with itself, it seems, like a schizophrenic force that can't quite decide what to do with my attention. Then the latter is and I finally see where I've been heading for God knows how long. If the levity of my surroundings was somehow too subtle a hint concerning this reality, the humongous blocks of gray and brown and an added multitude of muted colors do the job. Together with horses and carriages, trotting and shuffling through the wide cobblestone streets. Men and women wander about in gloomy daisies, near indistinguishable from one another in the thick overcoats and obscure headdresses. Where are we? I hear myself speak. This feels like nowhere. St. Petersburg, the voice behind my shoulder responds, but not the one you could ever see in your time. With his hand, he gives me a candy clap on my upper arm. This is where my route ends, my friend. My legs straighten, forcing me to my feet, to eye level with Fyodor. His gaze is solemn, yet secure, a sad kind of serene. What do you mean? You said you are in charge here. I also said that this train is self-sufficient and also timeless. Yeah, you did, I say, and I almost cannot bring myself to ask questions now, yet I have to. What's your point? The next time, he says, a soul gets lost in a Transibirskaya, chances are the day will cross paths with me. Then I might listen and tell again, for stories are the codes to fuel our lives. And the rails are less spaced in time. The days and nights, the minutes and moments that we spend forming our memories for the coming present. And so I am in past and future at once. However, as trains one day break down, so will I tire from this passionate mission of mine. And what then? I am too caught up to wonder, too absorbed to doubt this reality. What about this train? It shall keep running as long as there are travelers willing to fuel its memories. But now, as they say, I must go. No valediction, no final exchange. Nothing of sentimental semantics passes between me and the person I feel like having known my entire life, for I had heard the totality of his. The moment Fyodor wakes out, walks out, the surreal scene on the other side of the glass becomes hazy, muddy, misty growing indistinct and vanishing in a nebulous nirvana. And I am alone in my compartment again. But my solemn solitude lasts not for long. People come and go. I visit others in equal measure. The sharing is bountiful, exuberant and rich. I remember no faces, but everything else lies behind them. Then, after a time that has taken a break on this locomotive, I settle in my compartment again fatigued and lead night, throwing a glance outside again, curious what I would see this time. What I see surprises me little from my journey's end, just like that of the conductor Fyodor, has only been a matter of time. My humble hometown, the void of the fall of leaves in autumn, and also of the wildness of colors pertinent to the season. It is not yet September at this time in the past. Things that happen afterwards stamp any kind of impression to my memory, for the grand spectacle lies behind me in that train out of time. One day I might cross paths with other passengers through time, and then we will weave together a grandness of tales. Thank you, Lisa, and everyone, actually. Thank you so much, Mario, for your contribution. Uh, for all of you who want to read up on Mario's piece, Train Out of Time, you find the link in our YouTube chat um, and you can just get there and read the whole piece whenever you like again. Next up, um, we have Lisa Batista joining us. Lisa is a Brazilian born Miami local inspired by her surroundings from iguanas to salsa music. She's a student completing her MFA in creative writing at Florida International University, teaching middle school and mothering her preschooling son, her sweater-loving sphinx, and her shelter-adopted dog simultaneously. And Lisa is going to read to us excerpts from her nonfiction piece, 13 Candles, No Wishes, which was published in our fall 21 issue. So Lisa, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much. I am super excited to read this lyric essay dedicated to Julie Meepers. Birthday candles, no wishes. One, the owner's daughter. I grew up in a nightclub with people of the night in Miami, starting at 13. I was raised between mojitos and bottles of Corona with lime. I was raised with Latin music and Spanish speakers, dancing all night only with those who worked for my father or his friends under his supervision. I was raised wearing red lip and a scowl because at 13, my body was all woman, 5'5", five, five, 103 pounds, C cups and thick brown hair to my waist. My mother told me never to be friendly to the men who talked to me. She said, never give excuses like, I have a boyfriend, I'm taken, I'm here with my parents. They don't care about that stuff. Tell them no, tell them your age, tell them you're the owner's daughter. We take it inside. It is one of the last times I visit the club. We circle the west side of the guitar bar of the VIP section. We take a small silver leather table. We get a bottle of Milagros tequila, limes, cherry, skinny straws, and two sparklers that as long as the merengue playing over the speakers. I'll dance a salsa song with my dad on the dance floor and people will stop dancing and move over to watch us. They know who we are. The song will end and my dad will throw me into the arms of another coworker and I'll dance three more songs with the nightclub employees. We all feel it in the triple spins, the Cuban salsa steps, the flailing arms and body vibrating, hands on hands and sometimes on shoulder blades. They know I'm still the owner's daughter. The song comes to an end. Number six, my father is a four leaf clover dressed in a suit. My father started shoe shining at six, selling popsicles and plastic bags at eight. And by 13, he was running his own Espiritismo congregation in downtown Goiânia, Brazil. Espiritismo, the same religion my mother was baptized in. My father rents out a small store and hosts his congregation of 13 people every Thursday. He swallows bottles of rum, but he doesn't get drunk. He eats malagueta peppers by the handful, but his mouth doesn't burn. When the spirit takes over, you become a vessel, grateful to become the chosen one, accepting the offerings. He's a Virgo, so it makes sense that his drive, his focus and ambitions make him successful. He got what he wanted always. My father knew the power of manifestation and reeled it into his life, pulling everything he desired towards him. Consequences always weighed less than a risk. I get my impulsiveness and trigger happy snap judgment from him. He ran a pharmacy by 18 and by 20, he had crossed the American Mexican border by foot hitchhiking rides inside the cushions of an old car driven by an old couple who dropped him off in Boston. There he finds three Brazilian friends to room with and begins to bus at a restaurant with the best French. My father tells me, you can tell the quality of the restaurant by their French onion soup. I order it everywhere I go. When it comes to my mother, my mother's survival is a mystery. My mother has no birth certificate. She doesn't have a real birthday. My grandmother says it's February 15th, but I know she's not an Aquarius. She's definitely a Sag. Her American birthday always agrees with me, December 13th. She was born in Brazil into a Espiritismo tribe, Ubanda. Think of Santeria, but married to Yoruba. I kept out of the history of the past of my mother's life, but I was told that when grandfather gathered in the backyard, they would pray until possessed by a higher spirit, their corporal bodies would be given to the spirit offerings. In turn, the spirit would give advice or warnings. His voice becomes hoarse and sounded as if more than two voices were talking in synchronicity. He says, my mother is in danger. She needs to be baptized. She's just a baby. My mother will run away to the city, Goyanya, and become a model. She escapes her family, finds a new life, finds my dad at his bar and gets pregnant with me three months. Gets married to him two months after that. And by the time I'm a year old, we're on a plane 
headed to Miami. 13, dance, dance. A 13 year old girl with a woman's body runs around a nightclub eating fries in the kitchen, making Shirley temples in the service bar, standing outside with red lipstick on, chin up high, invincible. It's 5 p.m., it's midnight, it's two in the morning. She's out there. She believes she's untouchable because she's the owner's daughter and they are terrified of him. They were hungry, they were tempted. She felt it in the way they moved their hand a little lower onto the hip when they taught her ballroom salsa, one, two step, Dominican bachata, lambada. She felt it when they taught her how to eat with chopsticks, holding her hand like scissors, when they fed her gummy worms. But she also knew she wasn't risk. She held on to that notion like she held on to her Leo ego. She kept on dancing. The song never ends. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us um, today and for reading your wonderful work to us. Thank you. Uh, and if you in the audience enjoy the readings as much as I do, um, please uh, leave your comments, your thoughts in the YouTube live chat and let us participate a little bit and be in communication, although we're only so virtually. Okay, um, next up, I have the pleasure to introduce Gamze Saimas. Um, she will close this first block of tinted readings before our CCTA action. Gamze is a Berlin-based poet and video artist from Istanbul. She's currently studying horror cinema at Freie Universität. She's an editor at FU Review. FU Review. She talks and sulks a working lot about soft spots, home, hauntings, intimacy, and food on certain video sharing platform at Off Sea Tide. Her work has recently been showcased at Komshu Cafe Collective, Karg Art, and Studio H. And previously, she's been published in Poetry, The Bosphorus Review of Books, FU Review Berlin, and Tint Journal, obviously. So, Gamze, we're really glad that you're here. The stage is all yours. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> this is Soak the Bad Fruit. Call you up next to the kitchen sink and say, I want to make things that won't break me. Things that are denser than each rib, but don't care for spilling each milk or for permanence. Things held less shaky in lungs and more like balls of sugar spit and cool. I want my lungs fine and everyone else's too. Things that swell like brushing teeth, humidity that collapse like making bed. Things that put me to sleep as a certain sort of monster. Hungry, or sure, but not lacking. Things kept unsweet. Won't grow arms overnight, won't grow legs, not between teeth things, things that are not on fire, not catch. Still, things of heat, of fuzz, of bloat, of juice. Poor light things with pause and an urgency to see. Things so small, so that I can hold them in and keep them quiet. I want to carry my electronics lower than my feet. I want to make things you can't take home with you, play things, lick things, the exact pressure of almond soft serve on wafer, like oyster, like broth, like nothing at all. Leave the mouth sweat and clear and shine and gaping. And if I could, everyone who is not you or me is half fiction and we are not much better and we are fools. Say wondrous things unfazed by the distance between two poor cars or sweetheart visas. Say worrying about soaking local produce, about vinegar, about time then. Say let that be all I know of dirt and sex. Say this house is ours. Your laugh spills out of broken fruit. Everything about you is seeds and sudden. Or say instead, next to the kitchen sink, with my hair rising and swirling, belly ache and cake, with my hair stood on end, and I mean on end, suspended soft and split and soak. I mean, touch paper in sky. Heels lean lighter than toes, then toes skim across the spill, more losing ground and slipping. I mean, lift, I mean, whole body suspended and mid dark, reconnect. No one can make us leave this house. This could have been pause. Blue light doesn't do much justice to your pause. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Gamsa, for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, time flies. Uh, we are already past our first block of readings for tonight, which is just unbelievable. So thanks again uh, to Mario, Lisa, and Gamsa for opening the evening for us. Um, now I'll hand over to my colleague, Andrea, who has been with PINT basically almost from the first day onward. Um, she's first been published in our inaugural issue, and then she quickly joined as marketing volunteer. And um, now she's also our vice chairwoman at our nonprofit association, TINT. And I'm super happy all the time to be working together with her. And so it's a real pleasure to have her as co-host for our very special special um, event today uh, featuring a climate change theater action. So Andrea is now also doing her PhD at the Institute for American Studies at the University of Graz. And she's actually looking at how climate change is represented in plays. So this is, I think, a very good combination to have her doing this part here. Um, so Andrea, I'm really glad that you're here with me tonight. Um, Please guide us through this part. Thank you. Hello, everyone, from my side as well. And thank you, Lisa, for the lovely introduction. I'm really happy to be taking over for the CCTA portion of our event today. In case you don't know what CCTA stands for, it means Climate Change Theatre Action and is a worldwide series of readings and performances of short climate change plays presented biennially to coincide with the United Nations COP meetings. CCTA uses theater to bring communities together and encourage them to take local and global action on climate. Every other year, 50 professional playwrights representing all inhabited continents, as well as several cultures and indigenous nations, are commissioned to, to write five minute plays about an aspect of the climate crisis based on a prompt. This collection of plays is then available to producing collaborators such as Tint Journal this year and those that are interested in representing an event during the project's time window. To emphasize the action part of climate change theater action, collaborators are also urged to think about an action, for example, educational, social, or maybe political, that can be incorporated into their event. It is a very exciting event that has the power to unite communities, as well as people from all over the world. And we are very happy that tonight, the penniless players will be collaborating with us to bring two of these plays on stage, as well as that Professor Ilona M. Otto and Professor Maria Löschnik are joining us for a brief discussion on how to tackle climate change in the different sciences. To begin with, I would like to introduce you to the penniless players. They are a non-profit, non-professional, English language theater group, were founded in 2007 and are based in Graz. They perform full length plays and focus also on improvisational theater. Tonight, from the comfort of their homes, they will be performing two plays for us. The first one, starring Julian Linner and Corinna Meitz, is Heon Yees, so this is the last apple pie, and Cecilia Savatius, who directed this play, is going to say a few more words for you. Uh, hello, so I just wanted to um, thank you all for this opportunity and also to mention that as nice as it would be to focus on just one crisis at a time, we did have to slightly alter the text of our first play to uh, reflect the other crisis that isn't the climate crisis that we're all dealing with. So I'll let my actors take it away from here. Hi, Mom. Hi, darling. I'm so sorry I'm late. I just got the pie out of the oven. Looks great. Yeah, so this is the last apple pie. Did she make up her mind? Yes, that's why this is the last one. Are you listening to me? Mm. Are you on your phone? No phones while we're on a call, remember? Mom, I'm not a teenager anymore. 
that's the house rule. Even if you're not physically at my house, the rule still stands. If you don't want to follow it, get your own house. Ouch. You can't say that. It's not my fault I'm stuck at the dorms. No phone. Okay. See ya! Okay, sorry. You know, the stock market is frantic right now because of the government's New Deal announcement today. Wow. So you're in the stock market now? It's the only way to get my own house with my own rules. I'm way too late compared to my friends. I might get some Tesla stocks. Or what was your customer's company running that smart farm thing? Their stocks will definitely benefit from the Green New Deal. You will never get your own house if you jump into the market now. Well, please put your phone away and have a chat with me before you have to go to work. Okay. How's the pie? It's fine. It's not what it used to be. Oh, okay. Still wish I could taste it too. When are you leaving? Tomorrow evening after work. I have a few projects to finish before. Can I FaceTime you? It would be so nice to see Nana. You have a job. A temporary job. I'm honestly thinking of quitting. I can't see us beating that big old corporation. I sit in front of the window all day, looking for birds that will never come back. Just to prove that the forest is worth protecting. Do they even care about our forest in that new deal? Which bird? Huh? Which bird are you waiting for? Skylark. Oh, that one used to fly over Nana's orchard a lot when I was young. Really? Mm, but I don't see them anymore. Why? Pesticides. Probably pesticides. But Nana doesn't use them, does she? No, but many of her neighbours do. They don't seem to have a choice now. I'm sorry Nana's closing down her farm. Wish I could go with you to support her. I know. She'll understand. I mean, she's had that farm forever. Is she okay? I think so. She actually made up her mind a long time ago. She was quite determined to keep running her farm her own way. But, you know, since she refused to use antibiotics to keep her apples organic, she's had a hard time fighting the fire blight. And the fire blight only started happening when the spring season became too hot. And then the flood came. I think that flood two years ago was the last straw. Yeah, that was unexpected. This year doesn't seem to be any better. I can't believe it's autumn weather. <laughs> Me neither. And the loss from this year's harvest was huge. But the new national farmers insurance covered her pretty well. I hope they don't change that in today's deal uh, announcement. She never imagined that she would actually qualify for benefits when she signed up for the climate scheme. <laughs> well, who would have? Just a few degrees. I really should have joined the other kids in the climate strike when I was younger. No, I don't blame you. I... I shouldn't have stopped you. I'm sorry. Don't say sorry to me. Mom, are we too late? Well, for apples, yes. I wish I'd learned how to make a pie before. You will learn. And I believe, let's hope that we're not too late. When she saw the leaves turning black, Nana already knew this year's apples. She didn't tell you because she didn't want to let you down. The apples in the pie were almost white. The beautiful red color had always been her pride. Is there anything I can do for her? Just do your best with what you're doing now. Maybe give her a call sometime. Is it another stock market alert?
That's your phone, mom. Oh, sorry. That was your Nana. She says she's decided to sell her farm to the government. They're going to build a solar farm. That is amazing. I, I never thought she would actually... Listen, Skylark, it came back. Well, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much to the penniless players. And it's really interesting how you improvised it with the circumstances that we're having right now. It was really, really enjoyable. Thank you. And because it was so great, I'm even more excited to announce that we also now have the second play. And it's directed by Deborah Siebenhofer and starring Leah Belschak, Simone Carli, and Valeria Mondini. And it is Fase Chalali's Fakov. Hey, hey, this is my window, okay? The kitchen window is mine. The living room balcony is yours. What's yours is mine. Ah. Yeah, exactly. You stole the balcony from me, remember? But now when there is pleasure feed at the kitchen, you want the kitchen window. Shoo, shoo. You can't shoo me, I'm a crow like you. <sighs> Go eat bread comes on the balcony. You chose the balcony. And now I want the kitchen window. <sighs> you can't have what you want, when you want, especially after displacing others. She's cooking chicken. I love chicken. Fuck off! Go! 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 Hey! Hey! Shut up, both of you! Shoo! Shoo! This crowds always. another home to scavenger at? Well, I'm here now, and I'm going to take what I get. That's pretty desperate. Aren't we all desperate? Yeah, but desperate enough to deny their fellow crows of what is rightfully theirs? Where else in this neighborhood are you getting meat to eat, huh? Only a handful of people lucky enough to buy meat now that cow Chicken and goat populations have dwindled. I don't know. I don't know. You don't know because you always got lucky enough and got homes where meat was thrown at you every day. The rest of us are out here scavenging and getting rotten carrots at best. Okay, okay. No wonder the rest of the crows were circling. Oh, hey, oh, hey, shoot, shoot. Hey, hey, hey. Crows don't shoot other crows. It's bad etiquette. Besides, buddy. You're lucky the vultures and hawks have left the city or you'd have stiff competition here. Yeah, yeah, those mothers are vicious, huh? Yeah, now you only have the pigeons. <laughs> the stupid pigeons, they're vegetarians. Oh, the pigeons are not stupid, don't be mistaken. They've adapted to becoming scavengers too, just like me and you. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh! It's birdie bird world. <laughs> Damn you pigeons! But you see, they have no grains left to eat, so they're looking for meat. Or, like I said, taking what they get. Yeah, but I know. Now that I thought there were only crows left in the neighborhood. There might be only crows left if we don't smarten up. We'll be feeding off each other's carcasses soon enough unless we move. 
Move. <laughs> Move uh, to where exactly? Papaya County. You will remain a scavenging crow, waiting for luck to throw you a piece of meat to fight over. Yeah, papaya candy is the place to be. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? The fact is that um, it sounds like some stupid utopia where everyone is happy and there's plenty for all. It's true though. Yeah, the rivers flow clean and serene. And farms don't have scarecrows. <laughs> well, what are we doing here then? Exactly what I'm saying. Let's get to the better place and rest. And eat without having to fight for each single morsel. I mean, how could there be a place without crows to scare? Yeah, indeed it's pretty peaceful out here. Wanna take a trip there? Well, actually, yes, yeah. I think that I could go there and take over. This is exactly why we never get invited. Yeah, because of stupid crowds like you. You stay here, wait for your small pieces of meat. I'm off with those who actually want to join me. This is the one time I don't have to compete with the bullies of the sky, the hawks, the eagles, the vultures. I can rule. I'm off. Who wants to join me? Absolutely incredible. You couldn't see it, but in the Zoom chat where all of us can see each other, the writers and the performers, it was just like, we really, really enjoyed that one as well. Thank you so much again to the penniless players. It was just awesome to watch, even if it was over Zoom, sadly, but really awesome. So we have decided to incorporate a CCTA event into our reading this year because Tint Journal wants to be a part of tackling the issue of climate change through the arts. In the summer of 2021, we have organized a writing workshop and reading in cooperation with Wissen Lesenswert and the Brief Earth Collective, titled Writers in Climate Crisis, where six Graz-based authors grappled with the greatest challenge of our time up close and personal with their cli-fi stories and eco-poems. We hope that Writers in Climate Crisis will return in 2022 as well. Furthermore, Tint Journal is also committed to publish climate change literature in our issues, which leads me right on to our next reader, whom we've invited today to perform her eco-poem published in our Fall 19 issue. Lisa Seuss is a German poet writing in English. She has been attempting to create poetry that is both profound and funny for the last five years. Lisa lives in Amsterdam, where she regularly attends courses and events of the International Writers Collective. Her daughter was born two years ago and keeps both inspiring and preventing her from writing. She will be reading her poem on an island far away. Thanks, Andrea. On an island far away, cliffs fall into the sea with the kind of beauty that's hard to cope with when you're an atheist. The only development are condos, etched into the wall by rabbits. Every summer, puffins move in after a winter at sea. Do the birds force out the rabbits with their red beaks? Or are the rabbits renting out the units, charging extra for burrows with a few of confetti bombs exploding from the rock? Thousands of gannets white birds with black wingtips like soft ice cream dipped in chocolate. While I contemplate whether the rabbits are slumlords or victims of seasonal gentrification, I open a muesli bar, dark chocolate, macadamia, cranberry. 
I marvel at the beauty and decadence involved in farming, harvesting, assembling those ingredients, just so a girl can pick up a package of four snack-sized bars for £2.40 at the supermarket and eat one on the edge of a windswept cliff. I carefully put the plastic wrapper in my pocket. A hundred miles off this coast, an oil rig extracts black gold from the ocean floor. I walk along the cliff, the ground like a trampoline. A man walks by with a Tesco bag, nods, you're right, without expecting an answer. If I had said no, would he have opened his Tesco bag and fed me Walker's crisps, like a modern day elf appearing to lost wanderers? I tally the number of puffins I spotted today. Nine. A coping mechanism of our time, deprived of gods and elves, counting, quantifying, organizing the world into snack-sized plastic packages. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, that was also very beautiful. Now, after these two plays and Lisa's poem, we would like to engage in a short discussion on the topic of climate change with two experts. We have Ilona M. Otto and Maria Löschnig with us today. Ilona M. Otto works as a project coordinator at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and she holds a professorship in so societal impacts of climate change at the Wegener Center for Climate and Global Change, University of Graz. She graduated a master's in sociology and obtained a PhD in resource economics. She's an affiliated scholar at the Resource Economic Group at the Humboldt University in Berlin and an associated fellow at the Berlin Workshop in Institutional Analysis of Social Ecological Systems, hosted by IRI Thesis, I'm sorry, Thesis Institute at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Our second guest, Maria Löschnig, is professor at the English department of the University of Graz. Her most recent publications include The Epistolary Renaissance, co-edited with Rebecca Shu, 2018, the Anglo-Canadian novel in the 21st century, co-edited with Martin Löschnig, 2019, Theatre of Crisis, Contemporary Aesthetic Responses to a Cross-Sectional Condition, special issue of the Journal of Contemporary Drama in English, co-edited with Nassim Balestrini and Leopold Lippert, 2020, and Green Matters, Ecocultural Functions of Literature, co-edited with Melanie Braunecker, 2020. Her long-standing research interests in ecological concerns is also reflected in a number of eco-critical articles on Canadian eco-poetry, Nigerian petro-literature, indigenous ecologies, and the general function of literature in environmental discourses as well as in her teaching. Among the current projects are an introductory book on the Canadian short story for the Rutledge book series, Introductions to Canadian Literature, and the preparation of a paper for the short forms for a shared world symposium at the University of Uppsala in spring next year. Her keynote in the fissures between two epochs, doomsday paralysis and or joining the trilobites, which opened the conference Cultures in the Anthropocene, an interdisciplinary challenge hosted by the University of Innsbruck in June this year, will come out in 2022. Thank you both for joining us today. And to start off, we've heard now a bit about your work, but it seems all very theoretical, just put into words like I did. But I would like to ask you to please introduce to us how you encounter and engage with climate change in your profession and research on a daily basis. Should I start or Maria, do you want to start? Um, I don't know, I mean, I <laughs> maybe, maybe we let Andrea decide. Well, since I introduced Ilona first, Please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, 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 thank you for this nice introduction and um, yeah, giving me a chance to um, to 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 watch the, the, the performance and listen to the readings. Um, yeah. So, um, um, so well, every day I, I do something with, to do climate change. It's a part of my job. 
Um, but of course, uh, there are those kind of two dimensions. Yes. Yeah? So uh, uh, on one hand, hand, it's my work. Um, so I um, analyze data. Yeah. I uh, do some interviews. Yes. I, I travel to um, um, some places where, where we have some project. We carry out some, some research. Well, it's been difficult in the, in the last months. But uh, for instance, I just to give you an example, um, last summer, um, I spent some time in the German uh, Lusatia region uh, where brown coal is uh, still extracted. And we have a project there on transforming uh, brown coal areas in Europe. Um, and we went there and uh, yeah, had some uh, like small workshop with local stakeholders and then we uh, interviewed um, different actors. Um, so, so yeah, it's part of my work and um, and I, I try to see myself sort of like an you know, objective scientist and like, uh, um, and um, um, yeah, and, and I try to, um, yeah, kind of, um, um, yeah, no, treat it as, as, as work and, and do it as well as I can and also not, uh, um, yeah, not try, try not to influence the, the results and, and, and data analysis, so, so kind of, you know, be objective. Um, but there's also the, this other side, yeah, kind of more uh, emotional. And uh, so I'm also a citizen, a human, yeah, a parent. And um, yeah, and, and a few years ago, when, when I got to the climate uh, area, uh, like, so first I, I was kind of curious, and then the, the more time, Past and then more, I, I started to be involved in this work. I, I kind of put different pieces uh, of knowledge together, and um, so maybe like one very important point in my career when when I was working for a project funded by the World Bank, and uh, our task was to write a report uh, on the impacts of climate uh, warming um, at the four degrees level. So so sort of that assumption: what what if we fail the um, to, to limit global warming and what happens if by the end of the century we'll get a global warming that is on the level like four degrees and more at the end of the century and what it means uh, for to different uh, economic sectors like for agricultural production for social stability um, for also energy production um, and then um, we put um, so, so it's like Maybe not everything, we, we don't know everything, even a center. So there are some un, unknowns and there are some no, knowledge gaps. But if you put those pieces of knowledge together that, that, um, that you have, then you understand that uh, probably uh, like getting to those higher degrees of global warming, it's actually kind of the end of the civilization as we know it. Yeah? That maybe um, some people will be able to survive, um, but uh, you cannot really um, imagine even agricultural production in such conditions, yeah? because it means like very uh, high uh, frequency of different climate extremes, so like heat waves, um, uh, desertification, like land desertification, soil erosion, uh, also floods, and um, uh, like the frequency of different uh, diseases, like uh, in human health, but also uh, diseases of crops and, and livestock. And, and then you yeah, so maybe it's possible, will be possible to produce food like in closed systems, like in greenhouses, but not in the way how we know it uh, or how we do it today. Um, and of course, uh, if you start producing food in closed systems, so like in greenhouses, then of course the price of food will increase um, dramatically. So, so then it's quite obvious that you might sustain sustain some um, life of some people, but uh, but probably not uh, 10 billion of people um, that, you know, that's the, the, the population projections, projections towards the second parts of the center, part of the center. And so, so um, and the same about like energy production and, um, um, and may, maybe even kind of political stability. Yes. Yeah? So it, it's quite also obvious that in those higher degrees of global warming, you won't be able to maintain um, political uh, national borders, yeah, as we know it, because there will be massive population movements. Yeah? People will not kind of passively wait to die in some areas, but they will start, or, or they have already started to move, and they will keep uh, moving. Um, 
so uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so it, it it was kind of a moment where I kind of understand what what it what it means and um, what kind of future it is, um, and it's um, um, yeah, and, and and there's this uh, exactly there's this kind of like more emotional human side of this, and and since that time I. Yeah, I also try to engage uh, in, in different projects and uh, I, I try to support different initiatives. Uh, I also engage sometimes in some art projects because I think the yeah, art is very important because uh, so, so so we have those scientific facts, yeah, we know them, but it does not bring people to to change, like to, 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 to action. So I think uh, art is very important because it helps to uh, exactly that kind of appeal to our emotions and uh, in us as humans. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. I think that would also perfectly lead to Maria and how she works with climate change in humanities. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrea, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Ilona, for your uh, wonderful uh, input regarding sort of the scientific part. And, uh, and you also mentioned the importance of the arts. And I think that's a, a wonderful starting point that, uh, that we actually recognize each other that uh, the natural sciences and the social sciences also recognize on the other side uh, what the, the humanities can do with regard to climate change and of course that the humanities work more strongly uh, with the other sciences and in fact um, I had a very good example of how this may bring productive results in, um, in the conference in Innsbruck, which was actually organized uh, by the Department of Geography and Geology, um, but together also with the Romance languages. Yeah? So it was really connecting um, scientists uh, from different fields. Uh, and uh, for me, it was really interesting yeah, to, to really get more input from, from other directions. And I think it has also um, been very valuable for, for my own perspectives and, um, and research. So what I what I do from my field, of course, uh, has to do with the literary culture, literary studies, and cultural studies. Um, uh, I teach almost each semester, each year. I also teach courses on eco literature, um, the Anthropocene. On um, I have specifically focused on eco poetry, what creativity can do in order to create a different form of awareness. Last summer term, as uh, Andrea knows, uh, we had a seminar on uh, climate change or actually eco-drama. And uh, it was another corona semester. So in fact, we had to do what happened here this evening. Uh, students made wonderful scenic presentations and filmed them so that we could all sort of participate in, in these scenic presentations, which was a great asset to the coursework. Um, and in general, I try to I try to make it uh, graspable what literature can do as a supplement to literature and the arts, actually, and the performative arts, but actually all other art forms, what they can do um, in order to, to um, supplement uh, scientific discourses. And as Ilona has already said, uh, the arts, of course, do things totally differently. And we already know what is happening. Uh, we, we have the data. We know uh, that uh, if we continue like this, uh, there might be no life or no human life uh, on Earth uh, very soon. Uh, but on the other hand, it is, it is a problem that is so... Um, gigantic yeah it is uh, the scale the temporal and spatial scale of uh, of this problem is so unimaginable uh, for human beings that it is a chance that literature can sort of break it down uh, to make it graspable and tangible for human beings yeah so literature i think is a very important mediator to to close or approximate this knowledge knowledge action gap yeah so it um, and especially climate change drama for example uh, it it also shows the 
interpersonal, intergenerational, social ramifications of, of climate change, you know, how it actually affects people on specific examples, uh, which then, when you show it on a specific example, uh, have this effective effect you know, that uh, makes you care. Yeah, when you see what happens to a certain family because this and that uh, has changed environmentally, this touches you differently when you just then when you just see data and numbers, which are also important. Yeah, and interesting, especially in climate change drama, um, uh, it, it is um, in in most of the plays or in a lot of the plays you have a climate scientist. Yeah, so the climate scientist is, is almost a staple in climate change drama. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's really a challenge for dramatists to, on the one hand, not be too, not giving the audience the feeling that they are being lectured. On the other hand, nonetheless, conveying information. Yeah? So it's, it's very difficult because you don't go to the theater to be lectured normally. You want to be entertained. So you have uh, dramatists and, uh, and authors have to wrap it up in a way that makes it palatable. And I think we've had very good examples for that. Yeah. So because uh, in, in the two plays, for example, we have this elegiac mode in the first play, uh, the apple pie one. Um, and it, it, it really um, yeah, shows it on very... Um, Trivial things, actually. What changes? Yeah. So this, uh, uh, when the mother says, "Yeah, we used to do, and it used to be better." So we have you have this narrative of loss. Whereas in the other play, we have we have this uh, another challenge in climate and eco drama in general. How how do we represent the non human in that case? Animals, yeah. So having the crows here as actors uh, was a very good uh, way to show analogies between species, and thereby introduce the thought of ecological democracy, for example. Uh, and we also had it in all the readings, yeah. But I don't want to uh, take up all the speaking time. But uh, in all the readings, in all the texts, you could see what literature can do by imagining certain scenarios. And um, by showing that creativity is in itself an ecological principle, you know, because it, it works with possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to close that now. I would actually like um, to take your last statement to segue into the next question, because you were talking about how climate change drama can mediate to a general public, for example, how climate change affects all of us. But I would be interested in how can we as academics, as scientists, as researchers also mediate climate change to the general public and not just to our own little community? Yeah, are, are you asking me now? I'm asking both of you. Okay. <laughs> no, Lona, would you like to start again? Yes, I don't know, yes, since sorry. I've talked so long now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can start. Um, yes, so I think... Um, it's, it's important to take part in, in different events, so just like, like this, to talk um, to, uh, yeah, to, to neighbors, uh, to, uh, yeah, like to talk to different um, also stakeholders. Um, so she, we, we try to increase it uh, at, at the Wagner Center, like to increase that the role of transdisciplinary science. So it's a science that it's not only done uh, among researchers, but also science that reaches out to, to stakeholders. Uh, and we're also stakeholders, so kind of uh, we are decision makers, uh, citizens, and organizations, also representatives of business and environmental organizations, or, or all kinds of um, government organizations, that they are part of the process of, of the research process. Yeah? Um, and um, I think it's exactly it's important to uh, to have those kind of participatory approaches um, and to. Uh, um, in a way, um, to let people be, be a part of, of this research, yeah, because uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important. Yeah? If, if me as a scientist designs some uh, future future possible development scenarios, like for instance for this uh, Lusatia region in Germany, uh, I think uh, with exclusion of local stakeholders, uh, I think um, 
people will not um, will, will be kind of against that. Yeah, but but if 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 the local stakeholders are part of the pro this process and they can say what is important for them, uh, what um, what they uh, what kind of future they desire, and then we work with them and um, and uh, implement their ideas in our work. I think then then they feel like uh, they are part of this and, and it's um, more likely that um, they will uh, um, yeah kind of follow our recommendations. So that's the, the, the approach uh, that we have and I think that helps to kind of get out of this scientific bubble. Um, but of course also some some kind of maybe not um, um, yeah maybe kind of uh, more negative sides yeah so. Um, so one of those issues that, for instance, like to have a, um, um, kind of like more established scientific career, uh, this, this kind of transdisciplinary work does not pay off. Yes. So as a scientist, you are rewarded by scientific publications, yeah, maybe also by teaching, um, by yeah, presentations at scientific conferences, but there's no kind of direct reward from, from the work of stakeholders. Uh, it's, it's slowly changing, but but it's still um, difficult. So if you want to have um, kind of like standard academic career, it's, it's a bit difficult uh, to uh, um, to exactly like build your build your career on this kind of transdisciplinary work. Um, but I think that it helps yeah to talk uh, with different uh, types of person to persons to engage and also try to understand the, the arguments of the other side. So, uh, yeah, this is what, what at least I try to do. Yeah, uh, I can only agree because <laughs> there are a lot of uh, things I um, I would like to say actually overlapped with uh, what Professor Otto says or has just said. Uh, but first of all, of course, I, I can do most uh, through my academic work. I mean, that's that's my job. And in my job and through my job, I try to reach as many people with uh, with what I do with regard to to creating awareness for for the problems of the Anthropocene. And I wouldn't I wouldn't even say it's just a small community. Yes, it is. I mean, it depends on what you compare it with. But uh, we, we actually teach a lot of teachers. Yeah, we teach a lot of future teachers who bring what they learn from us, what they experience here at university, bring it to schools. So uh, they sort of spread it to on to children and they in turn will actually take it home to their families. Yeah. So it's it's not really a bubble. It's it's definitely also an exchange. And apart from this, of course, um, I also try to to be in dialogue with a lot of different groups and, and not just with the sort of uh, the university um, um, uh, context and um, and try to uh, in general, try to open up venues that uh, take us out of this other danger, namely this doomsday fatigue, which is actually, especially now with the additional uh, crisis uh, due to the pandemic, which is very omnipresent. Yeah, you know, the people are just pessimistic and and. Uh, rather tending to go in that direction that it's it's too late anyway and so i don't care it's it's the show is over things like that yeah so that you try to make it clear that uh, the more you fall into this this chronic pessimism the pessimism pessimism the more actually you the more it is a self fulfilling prophecy yeah, so it is it is important to devise new ways of seeing things, also to help people to adapt to different scenarios, to make them to make the the scenario that our life as we live live it now is is probably outdated. Yeah, that we we really 
have to think new models of living. And here, of course, literature is a wonderful source field. Yeah, it's sort of a, a source pool of possibilities from which we can draw. And so, of course, from my field of literary studies, I try to draw attention to this and uh, discuss it with students, but also with other people. Yeah, what what possibilities there are from this side to change the the whole attitude towards the environment and actually also towards our future. It's definitely not a matter of, okay, we want to live as we used to live because that's definitely not possible. Yeah, so it's it's this getting used to different modes of living, which, which has to be conveyed and there are different possibilities for this. And of course, my strongest venue is, is in literary and cultural studies. And, uh, and outside, of course, with how I live and uh, interact. That's another thing, but it's equally important, of course. Okay, well, thank you so much. There's actually a lot more I would have loved to ask, but unfortunately we've run out of time already. <laughs> but I think you've picked up a few really good points and gave a great overview. And thank you so much for attending today and for talking to us. And I'm going to get back to Lisa now so we can continue on with the Tinted Tales part of Tinted Tales. But thank you so much again to the penniless players, to Lisa Seuss for coming today and performing her eco poem and to the two of you as well for having this interesting conversation with us. Yeah, thank you, Andrea, for um, taking this part as your part to hear. And I just want to yeah, add to these thanks. Um, thank you all for participating in this CCTA event. And I hope that we were able to um, yeah, provide some space for climate change discussion here and that also you at home um, in the audience can take away something from what you've heard here from the discussion part or and probably also from the creative part. So thanks again. Um, and let me probably use this transition to our second reading part to raise awareness for another thing, uh, namely for our fundraiser, which is still active on GoFundMe.com. Um, you find the link in this in the YouTube chat. Um, it's as I already said, it's a fundraiser because yes, we want to keep producing Tint Journal, but yes, we also want to um, move towards our next goal, which is that we finally want to start paying our writers. We really, really want that. Um, and there is just no other way around to do this financially because yeah, paying money sort of goes hand in hand. So if you want to support um, this wish of ours, um, please, please have a look at gofundme.com. The link is in the YouTube chat. And contribute whatever amount you like. All right, after having said that, let's get on with Tinted Tales. And for the second reading part, I'm happy to have Philipp Steiner here as the one, um, well, yeah, starting the second part. Philipp is from Austria. Um, he started to write creatively in 2017 during a semester abroad at Hendrix College, USA. His favorite genres are science fiction and horror. Aside from literature, his other great passion is to create music with his bandmates from A Annihilation and Grey Skies Ahead. He is currently pursuing a PhD in English and American Studies at the University of Graz. And he's also working on his debut novel, The Kerze des Prometheus, The Candle of Prometheus. And Philip has already published various texts in Tint, um, and today he will share one that has not yet been published. So I'm really excited for this one. Philip, the stage is yours. Thank you, Lisa. So before I'm going to start with my story, I just want to give you like a very quick introduction to the context of the story. Because it is a bit of a fragmented short story tale that consists, for example, of epist epistolary passages, but also of diary entries. So um, this story, The Old Typewriter, is about a retired author in his 90s who is living in a nursing home during the corona crisis. And it is meant to depict one week in the life of this old author, which is then depicted in, in the form of epistolary passages, diary entries, but also in the form of an essay and a poem. 
And I'm going to read some parts of this story now. Okay, hope you enjoy. The old typewriter. Dear George, here I sit at my desk and write another letter to you. I'm well aware, just like the hundred times before, that I could simply tell you about these things in a normal conversation. After all, you are my beloved son, who takes it upon himself to receive these letters written in my dusty, tiny apartment and to deliver them to my addressees. For this courier service, I'm immensely thankful. The feeling that I'm only able to express in the form of a letter. That is just the way it is with us old literary types. We are able to create fantastic fictional worlds filled with colorful characters who live interesting lives, who love, fight, die. All of this only with the tools of pen and paper. Yet the world outside of our books is a strange place to us. Interpersonal contact, to stand in front of you and thank you face to face, for that I lack both courage and words. Even in old age, this hasn't changed, especially not in these dire times, when the old and sick are hardly able to see their loved ones. It is all for our safety, they say, but what is the worth of my existence if I cannot share its joys with those who mean the world to me? How long is it now that my dear Elizabeth died lonely in her chamber? She is now separated from me forever. How many days more do I have to stay in this cage? It already feels like I've spent the decades in the confines of this little room. And so skepticism regarding my own existence and the world outside emerges within my mind. Have I ever really left this barren dwelling composed of one dusty window, a stained desk on which my trusty typewriter resides, an old cupboard made from dark acorn, a small gray bed and a tiny bathroom? Was I perhaps even born in this place, doomed to take both my first and final breath in here? No, I know that can't be true. After all, I have a son and granddaughters out there in this brave new world. The outside must exist, and I must have breathed the fresh air of its freedom at some point. Otherwise, how would I know of its existence? I'm lonely, George. After all, my household help, Berta, cannot be counted as good company. She only rushes through the room silently, her face masked, cleans what needs to be cleaned, and places unbearable muck in front of me when it's lunchtime. Then she disappears again, out into the great wide world. George, I would be tremendously happy if you could bring along my granddaughter sometime. I do miss their youthful, naive cheerfulness. Please pay me a visit with your little princesses next time. Your father, Maximilian Reiner, November 15, 2021. The Diary of Maximilian Reiner, November 18, 2021. Just now, something strange has happened. Only a few minutes ago, my son George visited me. Joyfully, I welcomed him, ready to embrace him with a warm hug and a cup of peppermint tea. But he only sighed behind his mask, shook his head, and signaled to me with a harsh gesture and a strict expression in his hazelnut brown eyes to keep the safety distance. How are you, father, he said and went past me to the table to grab the bundle of letters waiting there. It is all written in this letter, I answered, slightly demoralized because of this loveless greeting, and pointed at the letter at the top addressed to George Reiner. But father, why so many? He asked with a stinging sadness in his voice. Well, I have started writing again. After all, an old man still needs some kind of occupation. Without a word, George took the letters, put them into the pocket of his brown tweed jacket, and put a bundle of banknotes in its stead on the table. So, how are the two, my two lovely granddaughters? I inquired. I'm sorry, I seem not to be able to remember their names just now. You know, at my age, the money is for Berta for her shopping expenses, said George completely ignoring my question. But they're doing well, aren't they? Please tell me they are fine. 
what were their names again? I'm so sorry. Yeah, they are fine, came his short and dry answer. For what? You're going to forget their names anyway. That, that, that I started my voice trembling. That is unfair. You should behave more respectfully towards your dear old father. George nodded. The sad expression lay again on his shrouded face. Then he just turned around and made his way towards the door. Please deliver these letters. They are of great importance to me. And please, please, also read yours. This is indeed most important, I pleaded, was the shuffled along behind him. I know, Father, I know, he murmured. And with these words, he left my little world again. Not even five minutes after he had entered it. At the desk next to me is the cup of peppermint tea that I offered to him. It is still warm. Dear ladies and gentlemen from the newspaper, the Presse, attached you will find my lyrical submission for your writing contest on the topic of freedom. I hope that you will find it to be a riveting read. Gray Birds, a poem. Freedom, a lady in black. She who watches over liberated souls. A blade, double-edged and sharp. The tip shines, reflecting the light of hope. An end that justifies all means, yet often is the means of darkest ends. Freedom yearns the human heart everywhere, at all times. Like birds, we all aspire to be, to spread our wings, to feel sapphire's breath in our feathers, to bathe in the warmth of the sun, floating above all else. Yet some believe that we all birds have tired of roaming the bright blue sky, contently resting in the golden cage. Wrong is this depressing view. We gray birds too, like to lift ourselves into the air, relish liberation from earthly despair, love to have our heads high in the clouds and enjoy the contact with the newly fledged crowd when we fly with the rest of the swarm towards the splendid south. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for sharing your work with us today. Um, yeah, and I want to point to our YouTube chat again. Um, if you like what you see, if you like what you hear, um, please just leave a comment, anything um, as encouragement, of course, for our writers, also as encouragement for Tint. Um, yeah, YouTube chat is here to use for you. All right, um, as a second writer for this second part of tonight, um, I'm happy to introduce Tim Tim Chang to you. Tim Tim is a poet and a teacher from Hong Kong, currently in Edinburgh. Her, po her poems have been published in Beaufra, Diode, Cha, an Asian literary journal, and Cordai Poetry Review, among others. She's working on chapbooks which explore Hong Kong's landscapes as well as desires and rituals through the lens of tattooing. So, Tim Tim, thank you for being here and I'm curious for your performance today. Um, hi, uh, I'm Tim Tim. Thanks for having me. Um, I will read three pieces tonight. They're about language learning, frogs, and gender identities. Um, the three pieces are very different, um, but I do think they all point to a sense of um, interconnectedness and correspondences, um, correspondences among things. So the first piece is called A Brief Chronology of My English Accent. Um, it's published by Tint. Um, thanks a lot for accommodating it. Um, I try to chronicle my English learning journey with various objects. Um, yeah, so a brief chronology of my English accent. 1993. Wailing inside the NICU was my first language. 1996. First word came during kindergarten, a cloudburst of Cantonese breaking the hidden Hokkien bank. 1997. Migration lends me names. Tintin. 
in Hokkien, Tian Tian in Mandarin, and Tim Tim in British Hong Kong. The character for my name, Tim, equates being quiet to sweetness, carrying my mother's humble blessing. 2005 to 2008, a history teacher we loved read Croatia as Cotia. Some teachers used more English words when they were angry. Every syllable punched, heavy as a single Chinese character. I do this too to make myself clear. 2009, a sky full of songs blanketed me. I took South London from Florence and Machine on YouTube and the horrors in NME. 2013, university poetry courses taught us to dissect our names or articles. I found a heart next to a tongue, a tongue made of a thousand mouths. My name is the sound of licking the sky shamelessly. 2014, my name is Tim Tam in Australia, Dim Dim outside an Estonian bar, Chin Chin for drunk French exchange students. 2015, my accent is a, is a passport full of travel stamps. My accent is the peeling bark of a tree I hugged in Brisbane. My accent snowed Estonian ice crystals in the ears of an American in Vietnam. 2016, a British teacher I worked with remarked that my accent was beautiful. I didn't know compliments could hurt. 2017, my accent is also the way Phoebe sings Smelly Cat. 2019, my accent almost gave me a pay raise. My boss thought I was almost native. 2021, I'm longing for a new country to grow on my tongue the way Aspire and Aspirate share the same noun. Yeah, so this is very self-indulgent. Um, I'm picking up the Scottish accent bit by bit too. So now my best Scottish accent is Solly. Yeah, <laughs> um, I will pick up more on that. So the next poem um, will be less self-indulgent. It's called Frog Goes, Frog Gone. Um, I love frogs. So I'm trying to record the frogs that I have seen in Hong Kong, especially during one field trip. The title of Frog Goes, Frog Gone um, contains some puns. So Frog Goes mean cued frogs, as in dog goes for cue dogs. Frog Gone, as in the irregular verb go, when, and gone. So Frog Goes, Frog Gone. So Han Hao, Hern Gone. Tonight you're not dried and flat, blending into the road. You crock like no one's watching, loud, multiple. Among you, there is this halty laughter distinct, almost like a mockery, to the itchy fact that our blood is your food's food by the thick green soup of your lotus leaves and children, some of which will never grow. We thought you were extinct, and how the hell did you return? Our flashlights gives no answer, but to reveal you, stoic, resting on a bark or under a big grass blade, you, so many of you, looking out from drain pipes or swept into a gutter higher than you could leap. So we cup our hands to take you back to the wet bush by which you freeze, unblinking, as if making sense of the tunneling of God's hands before you turn left and right, then spring out of sight. Um, so I'm going to read my last poem. Um, um, the last poem is about the second Chinese female astronaut who suffered questions that her male counterparts did not have to. For example, do you need to wear a bar, a bra in outer space? Um, how do you deal with your menstruation? Who would take care of your children during your three-year expedition? So um, I wrote this poem to imagine what it's like to be flying as a biological female who refuses to be defined by any singular culture. Um, I borrowed mythical stories such as Icarus flying to the sun and Chang'e flying to the moon. So Chang'e is a mythical, a, a Chinese mythical figure. Um, and we celebrate her during our moon festival. So this poem is called Icarus, a girl talks to interviewers. Icarus, a girl talks to interviewers. You asked if I was afraid of the sun melting my eye makeup. I had waxed enough to know how beauty burned and some places were better left untouched. 
questions like ingrown hairs trapped under the skin in the wrong direction. My father named me after my brother, but never made me wings, not wanting to admit to his own misjudgment. I did listen, and I flew better. Oh, the solitude I had, not being father's favorite son, too loud, hachanga, not being telepathic. The sun was too bright for my taste. I packed my makeup, but not sanitary products, and waited for the moon to wax. Its murmur thickening my nape. Wuchang'e still wants me. I know she drank her husband's elixir to fly to the moon just to escape the celebration sex after he shot down those nine damn suns. You thought she was running away from domesticity. Did you ask her husband to water the Osmanthus tree or if Ainilis helped him aim better? No. So why did you act shocked as I ascended? We had always done more. Chang'e and I, to feel safe and approved. But now, my skirts opening upwards, my breasts anti-gravitational, the stars, the glitter on my eyes, free from your arbitrary gaze, unreachably mine or hers. On a lucky day, when the moon is red from the beads floating around me, some of which spatter in your face, you will know I've shed your ill-fitting space suit. So yeah, that's it. Um, thank you so much for hearing me um, share things I'm passionate about. Um, and I can't wait to listen to the next writer. Thank you, Tim Tim, um, for your wonderful poetic contribution today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and time actually now really, really flies because now we're at our last writer for tonight, um, which is Susmita Paul. Um, Born in Kolkata, India, Susmita is a bilingual writer who writes poetry, flash fiction, creative nonfiction in Bengali and English. Her works in English are published in Tin Journal, Through the Looking Glass Anthology, Plato's Caves Online, and the new Amrita Baza Patrika, amongst others. She's the founding editor also of the Pinecone Review. And Susmita has published her nonfiction text Flares in our Fall 21 issue. And she's also been part of our workshop Writers in Climate Crisis earlier this summer. So I'm very happy to welcome Susmita Paul also here at Tinted Tales today. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Lisa. It's always a pleasure to be with Tint and Be Tinted. So without much ado, I'll just go on to read uh, Flares a short non-fiction piece that was published with Taint this last issue. I sat amidst a group of popular girls in my new school. I was telling them the story about my grandparents being in love despite family rivalry. My palms were sweating. My eyes were flashing. One meaning of the Proto-Indo-European root bhel is to flash, to swell, to shine. For the first time in a year since I joined this school, I was feeling a sense of pride. The first time I had been to the tailor for my new school dress, I couldn't convince him to make the knee length skirt go below the knee. All my life, I had worn either long skirts or salwar kameez. I had worn jeans for a year in my fifth grade. And then, for some unspoken cause, I did not wear them till I was in college again. In my new school, girls in short skirts, arched eyebrows, and waxed arms and legs surrounded me. I looked at them in awe. Swayed by their air of self-confidence, I felt this might be the cornerstone of my own liberation. They were curious how my grandparents managed their life. Well, they immigrated to the USA. My grandfather's friend got him a small job there. With his little savings, both of them gradually built a life together. They looked at me in awe. That sounds almost like stuff for movies, exclaimed one of them. 
I smiled. I had been extremely excited to be a part of the Bengali recitation group, my first extracurricular activity since I had joined this school a year ago. I had chosen a fine sari, dressed up, and had come to school that day. With an unfeminine voice and unshaped eyebrows, I had felt beautiful and eager to share my talent at elocution. The teachers had appreciated my performance. I had been very happy. We had gone back to school where we had to change back to our school dresses. I had walked along the corridor, passing laughing eyes, feeling uneasy. I had seen the girls idling away in the bathroom. The popular girl with the orange framed spectacles had smiled at me. I had smiled back awkwardly and had gone into a toilet cubicle. Before I could have locked my door, a loud click of a lock had sounded. I had turned the knob, the door had already been locked, they had erupted into loud laughter. I had a panoramic vision in my mind's eye. I had been stuck in the cubicle, breathing heavily and almost able to hear my heart palpitate. The orange framed spectacles had been blurred with tears of hysterical laughter. A few of the new girls washing their hands or standing there wiping their hands with paper towels had been looking at my locked door. After a while, the laughter had subsided. With another click of the lock, the door had opened. The girls had stood there looking at me. I could hear my heart beat and a swelling sense of ignominy rise to my eyes. I had washed my hands quietly as my eyes had blurred. Before a trace of a tear scratched through my face, I had precautionarily washed my face. I had walked out of the bathroom with a punitive aftertaste on my tongue. Something was burning. Another meaning of pain is to burn. In an otherwise loving family, I'd remembered that my grandmother used to call me out for having a long neck like a crane. Memories of silent ruptures had torn through the hallways as I had been walking back to my classroom that day. And then what happened? How did they return to India? How are things in your family now? The orange framed spectacles looked at me with concern. Well, I struggled. Ring. The lunch hour was over. I promised them I would complete the story another day. I closed my almost full steel tiffin box. No one noticed that my face had lost its color. Pale is also the root of bleach, German bleichen, cause to fade. I watched as the girls left the room one by one. I could finally breathe. On nights like these, as I tucked myself to sleep with the small transistor radio playing Hindustani classical music, I pondered over what I lacked. I had a great life. I was born in a loving joint family with conservative ideals. I was encouraged to pursue dancing and painting. I was protected from swimming because you could see flesh while doing it and from cycling because it was too manly. I was chaperoned around wherever I went. I was given things often before I asked for them. It was terrible. I felt too fair, which made my black body hair stand out all the time. I felt that by being in a new school, I was again at the beginning of the track from where the race to popularity and eloquence began. 
I shrugged and stopped my train of thought. I needed to be prepared with a flamboyant episode from my fictional grandparents' lives for the next day's Tiffin break. My eyes shone as I cajoled myself to sleep. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Susmita. I think um, this definitely was a, a wonderful last contribution for today. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've made it through. Um, this was our wonderful Tinted Tales. It was amazing, almost two hours um, that I could spend here together with these wonderful writers, wonderful performers, wonderful academics too. And I hope you in the audience had just as a great time as I did. And if you had, um, have a look at our fundraiser probably on GoFundMe, or of course also look at internal.com where you find more stories and more poems to read, um, all from ESL writers from all around the world, actually from 54 different countries by now and numbers are rising. Um, so have a look at internal.com. Um, yeah. And, those of you uh, who participate, participated in our Instagram tote bag um, giveaway, don't be, surprised, don't be disappointed. We have thought of you and we've raffled the bags. So two bags go to the users Anar Anar and Nina Deve. Uh, we will be in touch with you via our Instagram account. Um, and if you didn't win this time, um, there's always another chance and there's also a chance to purchase one of our bags on ko-fi.com. You find them in our shop there or you just message us at info at info at internal.com whenever you like and we'll get a bag for you. All right. So this brings me to the very, very end for today. I want to thank everyone who's been involved in making this Tinted Tales happen. Of course, first of all, our wonderful performing writers tonight, and probably we can get a few of all of us again for the audience. So these are the wonderful writers, probably wave again at our audience. I know you can't see them, but they can see you. And hopefully next time we will all again see each other in person, hopefully at least a part of us. Um, I also want to thank the panelist players, the discussion participants, Maria Leschnik and Ilona Otto, my wonderful co-host, Andrea, of course, our technicians behind the scene, Marcel and Ronnie, and also Filippo and Bianca for plastering grass with our Tinted Tales posters. And I want to thank our financial supporters for tonight, which are ÖH, Uni Graz, Stadt Graz and Land Steiermark. Thank you all for supporting Tint. And I wish you a wonderful, lovely evening. Thank you for this great time.